everyone. I'm Mari Silva. I'm a full-time coach here at NVVA and DVC, and this is our first Volleyball 101. Today, we're going to be talking about the 10 rules you should know about volleyball. Our first guest today is Tia Story. She's the Director of Operations here at NVVA, and she's also a CHRVA Regional Referee and a USAV National Scorer. Tia started officiating the game in 2000 as a player. She earned her NPR regional status in 2003 and her national scoring patch in 2005. In the past 15 years, she has officiated at USA Volleyball Adult Open uh, Nationals, Special Olympics regional and national competitions, and many others. Hi, Tia. How are you doing? I'm great, Mari. How are you? I'm doing good. Just staying alive here in this quarantine. <laughs> right? Yes. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. So as I mentioned before, we're going to be talking about the 10 rules that everybody should know about volleyball. So let's start with the very basic here, the scoring. Uh, we can talk both about the visual score and the score sheet. Sure. Well, so um, there's two, as you just mentioned, there's two ways uh, for keeping score. And um, the, the record that uh, is used by the tournament is a paper score sheet. And on that score sheet, they keep track of substitutions, uh, the points, the libero serve, um, penalties, and all of the information you could ever want to know about that match, who the R1 is, who the R2 is, who the work team is. So there's a lot of information on that score sheet. Um, of course, the spectators don't need to know all that. So we have a visual score so that everyone can see you know, what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yes, and what, what everybody needs to know is that the, the visual score, like the scoreboard, is not official, right? It's just for the fans and the players to uh, be able to, to keep track of it. But the, the score sheet is the official uh, score that whatever is down there is what is happening in the game, right? That's correct, yeah. So the, that, that piece of paper, like I just said, is very important. And um, they, the work team works together to make sure that visual score is in line with what's on the paper. But at the end of the mm -hmm. day, what, whatever that paper says is that's what goes. So, yes. <laughs> so just like in, in general, so it's a, each set is 25 points, right? And it depends of the, of the competition. We can play to best of five or best of three. How will we decide that? Um, so, uh, in a decide so when it's a match, best two out of three or best three out of five, um, if the first two games are to 25, um, you have to win by two. So, um, it could go up to whatever the score needs to be in order to win by two. Uh -huh. Um, the third game or the fifth game would be a deciding set and that's game that's played to 15. Again, mm -hmm. they have to win by two. So, yeah. And usually at club volleyball, we usually play best of three games, mm -hmm. right? All right, Occasionally, so you'll see where a match is played. All three games are played, regardless of whether uh, who won the first two. But typically, mm -hmm. we do match play. OK, perfect. All right, so now rule number two. We have number of players on the court and number of hits. And we can also go over the, the first contact uh, rule over here, too. Yeah, so. Um, so it's in, in competition, in uh, tournament competition, you're required to have six players on the court in order to start a game. Um, and uh, they are allowed to have three contacts to get the ball over. They can use less if they like, but three is the traditional <laughs> method of volleyball. That's the goal. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, so the exception to that would be a block. So we are allowed to contact the ball in, in what we would call a block and then our team gets three more contacts to get the ball over the net. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the definition of a block is interesting um, for a spectator because it's dependent on where a player's hands are in relative to the net. So if my hands are anywhere in the plane of the net, I am considered a blocker. So if the ball just touches the tops of my fingers, I have blocked the ball and now my team has three more attempts to contact the ball. Uh, and sometimes that's a, that's a hard call for the ref because sometimes you jump, but you contact the ball when you're way down. So mm -hmm. your hands are not above the tape of the net anymore. So it's not considered a block, right? Correct. Yeah. And that's, so. that's really hard for um, a lot of people to see as well. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that fine line between top of the tape and below the tape. <laughs> yeah, even for the ref, it's a, it's a hard call. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. There's, 
That's why there's um, two refs on the court to try right. to do that. <laughs> yeah, and that happens, I think that happens more often with club volleyball because the kids are still not too tall. So sometimes they jump and they still don't reach the, the tip of the net. So that can, ha can happen more often on a, on a club uh, game than on a college game, for example. Right, mm, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Good, so now uh, the next rule here is uh, how to rotate on the court because you have to be in a specific spot before the serve goes on, right? And uh, number of subs as well, how many subs you can have in a set and things like that. So, um, so there's six positions on the court, as we talked about uh, in the, you know, before you have to have six players, so they have six positions. Um, and they have to start in their positions every time a play ends and they get ready to start a new one. So uh, if you see a score sheet or, or a lineup sheet, you'll see there's numbers one through six. Um, and once everyone's placed into a starting position, that's where they have to be. And then we rotate clockwise. So as we're rotating clockwise, we still have to start in our position and then we can move after the whistle's blown. <laughs> right. there's some there's some guidelines around that but that's basically the way that works <laughs> yeah so and we only rotate uh once we score after the other team serves right so if you keep serving and you score five points in a row you don't rotate the same the same player keeps serving until you lose the point and then you score again and then you rotate correct right. yep that's the way it works yes and you and about the number of subs. Um, number so of subs, yes. They're allowed to have, in USAV competition, you're allowed to have 12 subs mm -hmm. uh, maximum, so. And it, uh, the number of subs also vary depending on the tournament you're playing or the level you're playing. Uh, for example, college, usually like NCAA, you have up to 15 subs. I believe NAIA, you don't even have a limit of subs. You can sub as many, as many players as you want. So that also depends on the, the level you're playing. Yeah, um, and also to highlight the, um, the libero is not a sub, so the libero mm -hmm. can come in and out as many times as they like. It's not tracked, um, so that's, uh -huh. that is uh, sometimes something to clarify for the spectator. Yes, uh, yeah, that's something we're going to go over. Uh, the libero is one of the rules that we have here. And also how to sub in and out. There's a, there's a specific way to do that, right? Let's yes. go over that real quick. Yeah, so um, in order to be considered a sub, you have to step in front of the 10-foot line. There's a mark on the ground uh, that, come, that extends outside of the court. Um, so a sub has to step into that sub zone in order for a, an official to recognize it. Uh, mm -hmm. And they, ha they need to happen one at a time. So if you have an occasion where you have two subs that want to come in, the first, the first one would step into the sub zone. The second one would stay right behind it and wait for that first sub to happen, and then the second one would step in. Yes, perfect. And you, only, you can only sub in and out after the, the person on the table record that on the score sheet so she can, she can know who's on and who's out, who, who's out of the court, correct? <laughs> right, thanks for pointing that out, Maury, because that's often <laughs> forgotten the poor scorekeeper at the table, right? Yeah, sometimes <laughs> so the players she... just run in and they don't even care. They just go in and want to play. <laughs> right, <laughs> I so know, we're all excited. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. and also when you mention like uh, for every rotation, you gotta be in your spot and then after the ball is served, you can switch. Mm -hmm. But it's also important to remember that you, you can switch, but in the front row or back row. So if you're in the back row, you can really switch to the front row, right? You got to stay where you are right there. Right? Correct. That's right. Yeah, front row have to stay front row, back row have to back stay row. back. Yep. And we're going to go uh, over that as well. Uh, and then the other rule here about the, the 10 foot line and being front row or back row. Mm -hmm. So now our, our next rule here is the libero. We just talked about it. But what are some of the cans and cans that the libero can do? Can do? So let's see, the libero can do great passing on the back row. Um, they're pretty much a, your defensive player. So anything that's allowed behind the 10 foot line, they can do. Um, they, they can even set from the back row uh, to a front row player. Uh, the new strategy, or uh, as new as I remember, because <laughs> when I <laughs> yes. used to play, or when I played, you didn't really do this, but Anyway, the, the, <laughs> the, um, the method now is if the setter takes the ball, they send it to the libero and the libero sets up to the front row, which mm. is great as long as they are behind the 10 foot line. Yes, if, right. if it's, they're in the front of the 10 foot line, they can still set, but with their platform, correct? They just can use right. their hands. 
Correct. Which That's right. They, they can they can set. Yeah. Correct. I, th I and, think that. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh no no. I was just going to say the the ten foot line we say in front or behind the ten foot line, but it is literally any contact on the ten foot line. So mm -hmm. not just in front of it, but if my little tippy toe is touching it. <laughs> Then, and somebody it's sees it, <laughs> it's, yeah, like, it's illegal. <laughs> right. Yes. So I think that like uh, questions about the libero is the one that we hear the most, like parents and, and fans, they always ask about the libero. So it, this is kind of obvious, but why do they wear a different kind of, different color of jersey? <laughs> well, so that's easily, that's so the officiating team can easily identify what, uh, what they're doing. Because remember their role is different. And so if a, uh, if the libero steps in front of the um, 10 foot line, I as the referee need to be able to know that quickly uh, because mm -hmm. they're restricted in what they can do. Um, and also for subbing in and out, you know, if you have a player just running in and out of the back court and they're not distinctly different, it's, it's it hard to causes see. the official to wonder what's <laughs> going on. So, <laughs> so it's all about the, the visuals just to make it easy for the refs. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, for in clubs and college, the libero is also allowed to serve, right? But they can only serve for one person at a time, correct? Correct. And actually, to, to further clarify that, the libero position can only serve for one player on the court. So a lot of times, again, we see teams that have two liberos, uh -huh. which, is, which is great. But if you serve for one person, then both liberos can only serve for that for one that position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds good. And also, uh, since the, the libero doesn't count as, as, a, as a sub, well, you just, uh, we just talked about the, when you sub in and out, you have to be in front of the 10 foot line. For the libero, it's the opposite, right? Since they're sort of just running in and out, they have to do it behind the 10 foot line, correct? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Again, that's why they're wearing that different color jersey. <laughs> just to make it easier. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. And one more thing about the libero, so they can also hit, correct? But it's like in the back, in the back row, front row, they, they just can be above the tape of the net, correct? Just like a, a back row attack for other right. players. So, so to define that, uh, you're correct. They can't uh, uh, contact the ball above the plane of the net, but let's, let's define what a back row attack is um, because that's also uh, can, can use some clarification. And just like we were talking with the blocking, the fingers, it's where your hands are. Mm -hmm. with, uh, with attacking the ball, it's where the ball is. So in order to be considered an attack, the ball has to be completely above the plane of the net. So if any portion of the ball is in the plane, it is not considered a back row attack. So if I'm a short, very, very short libero and I can jump and okay. contact the ball and it's still in or below the plane of the net, I am not back row attacking the ball. So that, that'll be a illegal, legal play. Right. Okay, so again, back row attacks is where the ball is. <laughs> mm -hmm. So since we're talking about back row attack, let's talk about the, the 10 foot line or for some people, the three meter line. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's good. That, that's our next rule here, the, the 10 foot line. So why, why is the 10 foot line there? <laughs> Well, again, that's uh, that. You know, for the for the rules of the game, a back row player is is not allowed to attack or block the ball, um, and from behind or from in front of the ten foot line. So basically, anything in front of that ten foot line by a back row player has to happen um, in or below the plane of the net. Mm -hmm. uh, so that marker is there as a visual, again, for everyone to see, and uh, for the referees to be able to monitor who and how they contact the ball. Uh, yes, and this may seem obvious, but the 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 ten foot line is there just to to so we know who's the front row, who's the back row player. But once the game is going, you can go anywhere, right? You just can't jump and and hit if in the back row. But the front row player can just run back there and chase a ball in the in the back row and vice versa, correct? It's just for the again for the visual to divide the to divide the the court in half. Correct, absolutely, yeah. You can go anywhere. It's just what you can and can't do as a back row player once you've crossed that 10 foot line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And another thing here is just, just like a, a, a back row attack, but sometimes the setter is in the back row and she jumps and she sends the ball over the net. It's just like the, the back row attack, that's a violation as well, correct? Correct. Assuming the ball is completely above the plane of the net. Mm -hmm. 
right? So, and again, that's a challenge as, um, as a spectator or, or even anyone other than the R1 and R2 who are looking very specifically for that because the ball can just be slightly in the plane and it's okay. <laughs> so <laughs> that's another really hard call for the refs to do. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's one of those angle calls where, you know, if you're sitting, it might look way different than if you're looking down on the net. So yes, it's a very popular call to, <laughs> to and setters, challenge. Setters love to dump. So that always <laughs> happens in the game. <laughs> All right. So next rule here, uh, we're going to talk about the antennas. The antennas is probably something that not a lot of people understand. Like why are the antennas there? Why do we have them? Why we, how we use them? So <laughs> let's go over the antennas. <laughs> Sure. Well, I, so the antennas are a way, again, uh, to mark the court. So if you imagine, um, you know, on the floor, we have a marking that marks our court 30 feet wide, 60 feet deep. Um, the antennas are the visual vertical way that our court goes upwards. So the play of our ball is not just what happens on the floor, but it's what happens in the air. So mm -hmm. they put the, the antennas are meant to measure that and so that we can visually see whether the plane, whether the ball's going in the plane of the antenna or outside of the plane of the antenna. Because um, if we go outside the plane of the antenna, then the ball is considered out. It is out, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, or touches also, it, it's out. <laughs> yeah. So anything outside the antenna will be illegal. For example, I'm a blocker, I go up try to block, but my hand touched the antenna. The ball doesn't, but my hand touched the antenna. That's another violation, correct? Correct. So anything that touched the antenna is gonna make the, the ref call something. Right. Even the ball as well. So if the ball, this happens a lot, the ball touched the, the net, bounced against the net, and we can, we can keep playing. But if the ball touched the net outside of the antenna, that's also considered out, correct? Out of bounds. Correct. That is correct. And we'll talk a little bit later about net violations. About net violations, yeah. yes. <laughs> so again, the antenna is just another visual aid for, for the refs. Mm -hmm. okay. And when the ball goes out of the antenna, uh, usually the, the line judges can see that way better, right? So usually they're the ones who help the, the first ref call in, in or out because their angle is just much better for them to see. Yeah, that's why they're there <laughs> <laughs> with their flags. Right. All right, good. So next one here. Now we're going to start talking about the, the violations. So let's talk about net violations and both uh, under or over the net as well. So there's many different net violations here for us to talk about. <laughs> right. Right. They, so the, the net violation, uh, so a net violation by definition is any contact with the net while I'm attempting to play the ball. Um, so if I go up and I hit or block and I come back down and I touch the net anywhere on the way up or anywhere on the way down, that's going to be a net violation as well as, um, if I, if I, uh, turn away from the net and I happen to catch it with my elbow, I'm still in the action of playing the ball. Uh -huh. So that's considered a net as well. What about your hair? Is your hair a net violation? If your hair touched the net? No. <laughs> that's not a violation? <laughs> No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, but your jersey is. So uh -huh. interestingly enough, any, anything that you're wearing, if it touches the net, is considered a violation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. What about uh, the, the violations under the net? Because you can touch the net, it can be a violation, but if your foot or maybe even your hand goes under the net and across the other side of the court, Right, so they've changed that rule a few times, but the way, um, the way the current rule is, is you can completely go under the plane of the net as long as some portion of your body is in contact or in the plane of the net. Um, the caveat to the rule is that you cannot be interfering with anyone on the other side. So um, I have seen some fun scenarios where people have gone completely under the net they have one hand in contact with the line. And because the other team was backing off, they were nowhere near the person. And it was a completely valid play. A fine thing. And that's something that maybe the, like a lot of fans don't know. So they see someone going under the net and they start you know, complaining. It's a, it's a violation. But if their little finger is there on the other side of the net, it's still okay to play. 
Right. Again, assuming no contact with the other, you know, no inner, no hazards presented yeah. with the other team. Mm -hmm. Now, you can also, um, the second part of that rule is a hand or a foot can be in the plane or in contact with the line, and that's still valid. So two blockers go up, they both come down, both their feet are in or, or on that line or in the plane, they're fine. Uh -huh. Good. And about what about uh, over the net? Let's say uh, when we block, usually we put our hands over the net and cross and on the other side of the ball, on the, on the court to block the ball. But what if we, like, there's no, nobody attacking the ball on the other side. The ball is kind of above the net, but it hasn't crossed your side yet. And you go up and you touch the ball. Will that be illegal or legal? Uh, so the scenario you just said, that would be fine. Uh, so the judgment of the referee is whether somebody was attempting to play the ball mm -hmm. um, on the first and second contact. Third contact, I can block that ball. I can clear the plane, block the ball, do whatever I want um, in order to contact that ball. But uh, the first and second contact, um, it depends on whether they're trying to play it. So, so that would be a, a judgment of the ref. Right. It's all up to them. Mm -hmm. Interpretation, good. <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard call as well, because it's up to you to call it or not. Some people have different opinions about the same ball, so it's another hard call for the refs. Right. Okay, so next rule here we have, uh, we have the ball handling violations. So we can talk about doubles, lifting, carrying, all of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So this is another fun rule that everyone, <laughs> that, er, that we all love to, uh, to discuss and debate. And it's even something that's discussed and debated at every level, referees themselves. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's, you know, it, we're always contacting the ball. So what it looks like and, and how we define it is, is uh, very complicated. Um, it's actually not a complicated rule. So basically a contact on the ball needs to happen simultaneously. So um, regardless of the rotation of the ball, as long as I have contacted it with both hands at the same time, it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and I have, again, as a referee and as a player myself, have seen many opportunities and times where the ball has been spinning forward or spinning backwards totally fine as long as the contact was simultaneous. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that usually happens uh, with the set, right? Because the set is the one who uses their hands way more often than everybody else, so. Right. And that's, that's a, again, that's another uh, interpretation call because some balls, one ref would call a double and others wouldn't. So that's all up to the ref to call it or not. Right, and there's a lot of discussion, you know, uh, over, uh, the way the rule is written is we are supposed to see the contact and that's really a challenge um, when the setter is away from us to see how the ball uh, is in their hands and out of their hands. Um, so, you know, it is definitely a, a controversial area. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the one that generates most of the complaints probably. Right. Contact. And I think that that varies as well with the level. If, you, if you're watching a, maybe a 13 or 14 team play, you're not going to call as many doubles as you would during a college game because the lab is just different. The, 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 set, the sets are way more, let's say, sophisticated with the college uh, game. So you're going to see different calls in different levels of the game as well. Right. That's right. I'm glad you pointed that out, Mari, because we, um, you know, as officials, we're trying to, the, the, the point is to let the game be played at the competitive level that they can play it at. Correct. Mm -hmm. So yeah. at least that, that's, the goal when I'm on the court. Um, and so those calls, those hand calls are definitely going to be, you know, different based on the level that we're, that we're doing. So, yeah. So let's talk about uh, maybe lifting and carrying. When do we, when would you call? Uh, sometimes, usually this happens when the, the person has an open hand and try to, to contact the ball from down here and then up. Mm -hmm. So what would be a lift or a carry for you? So um, just to clarify, uh, we don't call them lifts and carries anymore. They're called catches. Catches? So, yes. I didn't know so, that. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that, I think that happened um, last year at least. So we changed that terminology because, uh, so that we can better define what that call would be. A catch is something that's held in or on your body somehow. So just like you were saying, if I'm, 
if I'm contacting the ball and it rests in my hand, I've caught it and now I'm moving it. So that's a catch. That's, that's a catch now. <laughs> Good mm -hmm. to know. <laughs> yes. Terminology. <laughs> right. Yeah. And one more and thing. That, that call, I'm sorry, that call would be made at, on any contact. So to clear some people um, feel like that first contact, that the, the phrase is anything goes on the first contact. Mm -hmm. That's correct, except for a catch. <laughs> except for a catch. I was going right. to say that sometimes uh, we the, the ball with our hands and it's not, of course it's not perfect because it's a hard swing. So that wouldn't be a double contact, correct? Because you're just taking the ball. Correct. But if you did this, then it would be a catch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good. All right, nice. So I think now we're going to go over one thing that I, I think it's fun. It's something that not a lot of people know when to use those. Mm -hmm. The yellow and the red cards. Because they usually not, never happen. It's hard to see the cards in a volleyball game. But when they do happen, we need to know how to use them or when are, you using, are we using them. Yeah, so um, I'll say when I'm training, uh, uh, new referees, here's what I tell them. The, the cards that we use are how we communicate with people because we're up in the stand, right? So we want to start talking when we feel like people are getting a little bit, the game's starting to get a little heated and we're like, okay, it's <laughs> time for everyone to get back to the game, right? Uh -huh. so, so the first way we do that, I actually brought um, some cards. The first nice. way to do that is by issuing a warning. So the yellow card here would be a warning. This is just telling people, okay, it's time to calm down, right? We're, we're getting a little excited. Stop talking to me. That's right. very vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then when the second penalty or the next level is a red card, which I would hold up individually, at mm -hmm. this point, you've, you're disrupting the game and I want to let you know that. So we're, we're pulling this red card and that's going to cost your team a point. And if you have the serve, it's going to cost you your serve. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's what the red card is. Just one question about the red card. Can you give a red card before a yellow card or the yellow card would be the first step? Uh, I can give this and any of these other sanctions at any time. I don't have to escalate it. So, mm -hmm. um, if somebody gets out of control right, of, right away, uh -huh. they do something very drastic. I can go all the way to the last um, penalty if I need to. Okay, so, good. Right. Not you, usually you see refs going with the yellow card first just as a warning to calm everybody down, but mm -hmm. they don't have to do it. They can just go straight up to the, to the, to the red card. Correct. Okay. Yep. So then the next penalty would be if I were to hold these up together. This is called an expulsion, and this means I, I'm communicating to you that you are no longer able to participate in my game because, or in my set because mm -hmm. you've disrupted the game too much. Um, so that, that would be for a specific player, correct? Yes. Um, and this, so what this does is it doesn't cost the team a point because mm. they've lost their player and or coach and or staff member, whoever's on the bench. So um, it doesn't cost them anything, but they're not allowed to come back in for the rest of the set. They have to uh, sit down at the end of the bench or uh, be removed from the, the action. Uh -huh. And that's one for the set, and they can come back in the, the following set, correct? Correct. And then if I do this, set apart, this is called a disqualification. Mm -hmm. And this means, you, you know, you're really, in, you're not <laughs> you're being <in> appropriate. <laughs> that's right. You know, we, you, we can no longer have you in the area. So what mm -hmm. that means is you have to leave the area um, and you are disqualified from the match. Um, and I will say that if we get to this point, I feel like as a referee, I haven't done my job because you, this means there's a lot of things that have happened between you. You just, <laughs> you lost control. <laughs> right. Um, but you know, that those are there in case we need them. And of course in national competitions, um, we'd have to call an arbitrator. There'd be lots of things that would happen when that gets, uh, when mm -hmm. we get there. So, but those have, are our card. Levels. Have you ever used both cards at the same time? I have never had to disqualify someone from a match. I have had to <laughs> expel people from matches. Okay. Um, so it's rare. It's rare. I don't ever want to do it. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I don't think anybody <laughs> wants to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and just, uh, I think one thing that causes sometimes the, the yellow card is that everybody tries to talk to the ref, right? But only the captain on the court is allowed to talk to the ref, right? So. I, I've seen a lot of times that another player gets a yellow card because they're trying to talk to the ref when they're not allowed to. 
So if right. you have any complaints, you go to the captain and the captain is the one who needs to communicate with the ref, correct? That is correct. Uh, that's for the R1. The R2, the coach and the captain can address the R2. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, as far as speaking with the R1, that's the captain only. Oh, the captain. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to confess that I've, I've got in trouble for speaking to the ref when I was not the captain on the court. <laughs> it, it's, I, can, I can agree. <laughs> I've had my fair share of yellow cards. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that was good. That's a good explanation about the cards. I'm sure a lot of people have a lot of questions about the cards because they don't, they don't happen very often. So it's harder for us to know when to use them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so lastly here, I think this is going to be the fun part now, the referee <laughs> signals. <laughs> what do you mean with your hands when you, you do all these kind of crazy things? <laughs> right, okay, let's see. Good. Well, let's see, do you, wanna, do you want me to go through some basic calls or do you want to throw me some, some things <laughs> we can, we, we can start, We can start with the basics. So let's say even before the, the match starts, how do you approach the teams to, to shake hands and that kind of stuff before the, before the match even starts? Oh, okay, so as everyone's lined up on the back line, I blow, we would blow the whistle. And I'm going to try to signal so you can see it. Everyone's on the back lines. I blow the whistle and I do this. I just motion everyone to come in and then that's the cue for them to come in and shake hands. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then both, both teams are on the court. Now we're going to serve. Okay, so the team that has the serve, I'm going to point in that direction and I'm going to blow my whistle and then motion for them to serve over the net. Good. So since you talk about serve, what if I step on the line when I'm serving? Okay, so that's a little hard to show because I'm <laughs> you, you can't see my feet, but I would basically point down, <laughs> down at the line, mm. at the serve, and so just kind of pointing out towards the uh, the serve line. And usually, who call the ball? You, uh, the first ref or the the line judge would be the first one to call that. The Either line judge way. would notice that, right? And they have a different signal, but they point down at the line like mm -hmm. you would as, a, as an R1, and then they wave their flag to get the R1's attention. And, but again, like you as the first ref has the, first, the final call. If they don't call anything, and if you think they stepped on the, on the line, you can still call it, right? Correct, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up, Mari. That's great. <laughs> you know, we have a work team, um, but ultimately the R1 gets to make, uh, can make the decision on any call. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen a lot of times, sometimes the, the line judge calls a, a touch, but you don't think it's a touch. So it's up to you to call whatever you think happened. Right. They're there to help, but if you think they're wrong, which sometimes they are, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can overrule them. Yep. Uh, okay, so let's see here. If the ball is out, I hit the ball and the ball went out, out of bounds on the other side of the court. Mm -hmm. That's just like this. It's pretty easy. What if there's a touch? In the direction of the court that touched it, it would be a touch. That one, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing that people get confused, the difference between out or touch. Because sometimes the ball, let's say I hit the ball, someone blocked me and the ball went out, but on the side of the team that hit the ball. Mm. So that wouldn't be a, a touch, right? That would be just out. Right. Because you went back to their side. Correct. So a touch would be when the ball just lands on our side, but out of bounds. Right. That's, that's a, something that people always ask me, the difference between that. <laughs> yeah, that's, and again, that's, those are those minute, you know, very small things that, that make the difference between which call you make, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see, someone else, uh, some, something else here. Double, double and four hits, for example. Okay, so a double is just this, and four hits is this. <laughs> that's it just show the numbers <laughs> yep <laughs> and, and two it, two doubles is not only when you're hit uh, when you're trying to set the ball correct sometimes you maybe you make a play in defense the ball touches you touch the net and goes back to you and you even by accident you touch again that will yep. be a double as well correct correct so yeah or or if it's if it hits you but not simultaneously which is just what you said but to, so another scenario that we see is it might hit someone's foot and then it comes up and hits yeah. them in the forehead. <laughs> that's a <laughs> double. As well. That's a double. <laughs> and that happens sometimes. <laughs> it does. Uh, let's say something else. Uh, during a timeout, if someone asks a timeout. Timeout, it looks no. just like this. And then, right, you point to the, 
to the side that ask a timeout? Correct. Then we usually show how many timeouts they have used or they have left. They have left, correct? Uh, so we don't do that anymore. Um, that is uh, communicated by the R2. So the the um, the scorer would show the number of timeouts up to the R1 and the R2. Uh, that's not reflected back down to the teams. Mm -hmm. um, once the team's taken their second timeout, the R2 will go over and motion to them that they've taken their two timeouts. So they'll go to their captain or their or their coach and go, coach, you've got two, you've taken two. Okay, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always see some reps uh, still showing. Mm -hmm. So maybe they don't they don't know the rule either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, things uh, happen at such a pace sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So something that people always ask about as well is the the back row attack. Sometimes the the ref calls something and they do something like this or this. Mm -hmm. And then people ask, what happened there? So, uh, Right, so, so this um, across my body is a back row attack. If I do this, it's a, um, it's a net penetration. Okay, and then what's, let's say if, the, if someone, like the libero hits from, from the back row, but she's still under the net, mm -hmm. sometimes you see the ref doing like this with their hands, correct? Just to show that she was under the net. The game, um, the game doesn't stop. The, the, the ref is just showing that. <laughs> the cat wants to be part of the, yes. of the show. <laughs> give her a whistle. <laughs> uh, right. So, and that's, that is not a call uh, that's a standard call, but it is meant to be a visual for everyone because, again, there's a lot of feedback on that. So when, mm -hmm. uh, when a player uh, commits an attack, and it's not considered a violation, we'll just kind of do this, you know, like they're good, this is fine. <laughs> just to show everybody that it's fine. Right. <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Do you think we're missing anything with the signals? <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, there's, there's uh, well, so if there's a, you know, you get eight seconds to serve a ball, um, and if that violation happens, then it's, it's the, you know, you just put eight out like that to show that, um, that, they've to, that they've used their eight seconds. Okay. Uh, one more thing about serving too that we, we forgot, about, uh, forgot to talk about. If, you, if I toss the ball and don't serve and I'll let the ball drop, or if I catch the ball, mm -hmm. would that be a violation? What would you do about that? So in competition that's uh, 14 and, or over 14, you cannot, uh, you have to contact the ball once you toss it. So if you toss and drop or toss and catch, it is considered a ball that hasn't made it to the plane of the net. So it's just a net, uh, it's, a, it's a, uh, a bad serve call. That's not mm -hmm. the right term, but you know. <laughs> the same thing. And then yeah. under, under that, if you don't catch it, if you let it land on the, on the floor, you can replay. Under, it, for 14 and under Under 14. Mm -hmm. And then would be just, this is another signal, right? The replay? Ah, yes, the replay, <laughs> yes. So yeah, that's right. You would replay that ball. Mm -hmm. In what situations will you could replay a point? Uh, if there's, in a, basically replays are for distractions um, that happen around the court. So if you're playing in competition, another ball comes into your court, you need to stop play. And then of course that would be replaying that point. Um, if there's a dual violation that you can't determine which one happened at the same, you know, first, then it's a replay. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if, if the referee, you know, it, there's occasions where the referee will make a call and then they'll be, they'll realize that that shouldn't have been the right call. So they'll do a replay. Mm -hmm. um, those are the three top three. This is a genuine question. I don't know the answer for this. Let's say the ball lands really close to the, to the line and nobody can tell if it was in or out. Could you replay that because you don't know the right call or would you would have to choose something? Uh, so no, if, if you can't see, if there's nobody on the work team that can see that play, it would be a replay. It would be a replay. Mm -hmm. Good. That was actually, I didn't know the answer to that question. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. So you, you don't see that happening very often, right? No, there, there's, there's a lot of people on the team working for you. So it's, mm -hmm. it's rare that somebody didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, I think that was a really good explanation of the, the signals. I don't think I can, I can come up with something else that we're missing. 
with the signals. I think we, we cover everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could pull out my rule book, but you know. <laughs> those are the, those are the big ones you're going to see. <laughs> going to see it during the game. Yeah. Oh, so a substitution. I don't know if you want to if you um, that call. So if a sub does step into the sub zone, mm -hmm. then the R two or the R one uh, would blow their whistle and they would call for a sub like this. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. So that's and again, wait for the for the score for the score table to to put that down so they know what's going on the court. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, I think we cover everything. Do you think we're missing any, any kind of rule that we should mention? I think we cover pretty much everything that people should know when they're watching a volleyball game. Um, I think if you know those rules that you are going to have a great time watching the game. <laughs> You'll have less questions and be able to enjoy the, the game better. <laughs> I agree. All right, so thank you so much, Tia, for helping us out here. Even I, I learned a lot as well, some rules I didn't know either. So okay. thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, thank have you a good day. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. <laughs> of course, we appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you so much. Thanks, have a good bye, day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.